name is Wala Chabara, or I prefer that these days. You know how when you grow up, you start thinking, ah, these white names, man. <laughs> I want my real African name. Um, I also think of myself as a something of a scientist and an economist. So if you put those two together, it becomes something called scientonomist, if that makes sense. And the reason for that is simple. Um, I did a PhD in chemistry in my young days. And uh, in fact, when I was coming back here at age 27 with a PhD, I thought I was probably the youngest person to have that accolade. And then in my later life, I thought, you know what? I should go back to school. So I went and did a master's in economics. And it's because of that master's in economics that I've been recently writing articles in the uh, Daily Mail. If you've looked at the Daily Mail sometimes, on Monday there's their articles uh, entitled Innovation Made in Zambia. Um, and the idea of those articles is simply to try to uh, talk about innovation that happens in Zambia. In terms of what I do, um, I have that company, Innovare Growth Solutions, but what I'm finding more interest in these days is an institute that I call Futures and Foresight Institute of Zambia. And that institute has two objectives. The one objective is to look at trying to create futures, potential future scenarios of this country using futures and foresight techniques. And the other objective is to try to double into innovation try to surface the successes, challenges, pitfalls of innovation as is happening currently in this country, and a chance with that exposition to try to promote activities around innovation, and indeed, hopefully, the right courses of action to take innovation forward. And I'm going to dwell more on this latter aspect. Now, um, it's not very long ago in this country that when a family gathered for a meal, you had a basin with water passed around. And everybody washed their hands in that basin. Now imagine a family of six, seven, eight, and you the youngest. <laughs> now, if, if, if you fast forward to present day Zambia, you find that we don't do that anymore. We've become a bit more civilized. And one of those tools of civilization that have come up is this contraption that I call the table side hand wash system. It's a simple thing. It's a steel frame. It's got a bucket sort of on an elevated uh, position uh, with a tap in its base. And it's got at the bottom a little basin. The bucket is filled with water, and at the time to eat, just open that little tap, wash your hands, and the water gets collected in the basin, and you throw it away. Now, I recently came across a gentleman by the name of Enoch Banda, and I think, I'm persuaded, Enoch was the last born in the family of eight. <laughs> because he must have looked at this water in this basin. It was grayish, brownish. And I think, damn, do I need to wash my hands? Let's pass it on and eat with his bare hands. Um, he invented this system about 10 years ago. In fact, he even went so far as to register that design uh, with uh, then Pacro, now Pacra. Needless to say, when you walk around Lusaka or you drive around Lusaka, you see a lot of these things everywhere on roadsides, markets. Most dining rooms of houses have got these things in them. If you go to places where they serve traditional Zambian food, you'll find these things. The sad part of this story is that Enoch gets very little benefit from all those contraptions you see around. Why? 
because as soon as a few of those gadgets went out, a few of those systems went out, everybody that had a little welding system could bend a piece of steel decided to start making those things, started to imitate those things. And before long, these imitations flooded the market and Enoch was losing out. Now, um, you would ask, what should have Enoch done to make sure that he benefited economically from this invention of his? Well, what Enoch ought to have done, given the huge latent demand of that system, he should have gone out there and set up to mass produce these things, completely flood the market with these systems so that whoever wanted it could get Enoch's product. The other thing he could have done is obviously organize his distribution such that all these places where you could find these things, whether roadside or market, wherever, he had his product there. And he had the right incentives for the people to sell his product. Furthermore, given he had registered this with uh, Parkright, it would have been worthwhile if, if the legal environment was such that he could actually enforce that, uh, enforce infringement on his, on his design. Alas, all these things didn't happen for Enoch. Enoch remains today in the same career he was in 10 years ago. Probably the same financial status, if not worse, because he put all his money in trying to uh, put this business uh, to work. And that represents in many ways the perils, the pitfalls, challenges of innovation in Zambia. Probably innovation in most developing countries. And I guess we could have a long debate about what could be done about a situation like that. Uh, I've got a few thoughts. I'm sure you can all come up with ideas. But one of the biggest challenges that Enoch would have faced is the world we thought to set up this large factory that should have mass produced this system to flood the market. Now, people always talk about banks not lending and you know, why did he go to the bank? Well, banks hardly ever lend money to unproven businesses, unproven systems like that. Um, Enoch would have needed a different type of funding. And in other places, it's called venture capital funding. I don't think we have that in this country. And I think we needed it yesterday. If you had a place he could go to that offered this type of venture capital, Enoch would have set up this huge factory. You see, the failure of Enoch not benefiting from this system uh, economically is not just him that lost out. The whole country as a whole lost out as well. Because if he had set up that big factory, he would have employed quite a number of people, you know, in permanent jobs. Uh, his business would have been uh, able to contribute taxes uh, of this country. Um, the product that you see in most places is quite inferior to what Enoch himself created. So all those benefits have been lost out. And if we had means like venture capital funding to get this thing uh, off the ground, I think we'd be enjoying all those benefits. The other thing, obviously, that I think Enoch could have benefited from are the right competencies and skills, both in terms of business and management. See, Enoch has been working for the last few years as a technician at the University of Zambia. All he knows is the technical skills of putting this contraption together. The business skills are not something he's put in. So if he had had that exposure, those skills and competences, maybe the outcome would have been different. I've alluded to the uh, legal framework, legal environment for uh, intellectual property rights. If that was strong enough to be able to um, challenge the infringement on Enoch's design, again, maybe, you know, would end up with a different situation. 
and a different outcome, both in terms of ENOC benefiting, but also, like I said, in terms of the country benefiting. So we asked ourselves the question, do we have, is there any possibility, potential of succeeding with innovations in this country? Well, the answer obviously is yes. You can come up with a good invention that addresses a common challenge uh, in, in society. But there are challenges for making that innovation work. And I think we need to find a way of addressing those challenges so that innovation made in Zambia can fully become successful. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>